Now, uh, Marty and I uh, met uh, out here in the hall for this evening before the meeting, and uh, we had a little chat. And uh, the last time that I was sitting as I'm uh, sitting tonight was, oh, I guess about 12 years ago, and we spoke up at a banquet up in Augusta, Maine. And, of course, I've seen Marty a few times since then, and uh, it's certainly good to reminisce old times. It's good to see Marty here tonight, and uh, what words more can I say, but it certainly is with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce to you Marty Mann. I'm sharing Wes's feelings of being really moved on this occasion. High Watch Farm has always meant a great deal to me. It's given me a lot, a lot more than I've ever given it. And I haven't been nearly as close to it in recent years as I would wish. But to hear the kind of thing that Wes was saying about the exploits of the graduates and to see this kind of a group gathered together to celebrate the 25th anniversary, I think tells its own story of what the farm has done and what it means to a great many people. I want to start by telling you something I heard quite recently. I was in Kansas City two weeks ago, and while I was there, a friend of mine celebrated his 10th anniversary and afterwards invited a lot of people to his home. And a girl came over to me and she said, you're from the East, do you know anything? Have you ever heard of High Watch Farm? I said, yes, I have. She said, well, you know, we're all talking about it out here. One of our girls has come back from there, and she has the best quality AA that we've ever seen. And she said, I've been sober four or five years. I forget which it was. But she said, I want to go there, and I am determined to get there next year. Can I go? <laughs> I said, yes, I think you could go. People do go there for vacations, too. And then she proceeded to go on and on and on about how wonderful this place must be because of what it had done uh, for her friend in Kansas City. So you see, it isn't just in New York and Connecticut and around our own bailiwick uh, that the farm has gained uh, a wonderful reputation, but it's now spreading right across the country. I didn't realize that uh, you were getting people from that far away, Wes, and I think it's wonderful. When I was thinking about what I'd say tonight, it seemed to me that perhaps the thing that would come best at this time was a very simple description of how we, and I mean AA, uh, found the farm, how we came in contact with it. Now this involves a little bit of my own story, and so I will begin there. Uh, Many of you have heard my story, and I'm not going into all of it. I don't expect to uh, cut too much into the time of the orchestra and the dancing. But suffice it to say that at the end of five years of hell on earth, which I don't have to describe to very many people in this room, I had finally found a doctor who was willing to take me under his wing. He was the eighth that I had tried in a year. None of the others were willing to take me on. They had all told me that I could, uh, I had better commit myself to a state institution, and when I said for how long, they wouldn't tell me. So they confirmed in my mind my own belief that I was insane and that it was a type of insanity for which there was no hope, and that once I walked in and those gates clanged behind me, that would be it. So I wasn't very eager to do it. But the eighth man said he thought maybe he could help me. He said his name was Dr. Foster Kennedy, and he was a very famous neurologist and psychiatrist. And I had been given an appointment with him as a Christmas present uh, by a friend who was impressed by the fact that I was trying not to drink. I'd lasted six weeks. And that was quite a feat, I can tell you. And this had impressed her sufficiently, and I was so anxious to get some kind of help, and she rather agreed with me that I was nuts. And uh, she felt maybe this man could help me. So I saw him. 
and he was the head of the neurological division at Bellevue. What he told me was that people like me, in his experience, had one chance in a hundred, but that I wanted to get well so badly that he thought maybe I was that one. And on the chance that I was that one, he would take me on as a patient. I might mention here that I was broke. That's why my appointment was a Christmas present. And it had something to do, I think, with the turndowns I'd received from the seven doctors I had seen during the previous year. But he told me that he would get me into his ward in Bellevue, the neurological ward. He did not think I was insane, he said. He didn't think I belonged in the psychiatric wing. And he would put me in the neurological ward, and he would see me there at least once a week, and we would then see what happened. So that's where I went. And I spent seven months in Bellevue. During that time, I never got out, of course. They take your clothes away when you go in there, and there isn't any way to get out. And so I was sober. I had a lot of minor ailments that they were taking care of. Actually, you get extremely good care in Bellevue, medical care. And every week, Dr. Kennedy would ask me how I felt about it and did I think that I was ready to go out. And I don't know where I got the insight. I don't know how I knew that much, but I knew enough to say, no, I'm not. I'd probably be all right as long as things went well. But if I hit any problems, and I'm bound to, broke, no job, really nowhere to go, I know I'll drink. I'd been, incidentally, completely honest about my drinking with all the doctors. It just never occurred to me not to be. Because I recognized that it was, well, it was the kind of drinking I did that made me think I was insane. So that's what I was there for. This was in 1937, and I never once heard the word alcoholism mentioned by anybody. I didn't know the word myself. I knew I drank too much. I'd certainly been called a lot of unpleasant names by friends, uh, other names than alcoholic. That's a nice name, I may add, compared to the other ones. So I recognized that if I drank again, I would be right back where I was, uh, that it would be impossible, and I was afraid to go out. And I kept insisting to Dr. Kennedy that this wasn't enough, that just being locked up in the hospital and physically cared for was not going to straighten out whatever it was that was wrong, and that I needed a psychiatrist. Now, he didn't practice as a psychiatrist. He practiced more as a neurologist. And I was quite aware, in any case, that I wasn't likely to get that much of his time. He was a $50 a half hour man. And the time that he gave to Bellevue, of course, was free. This was a free gift contribution that he made so that I saw him down there, but I wasn't likely to become a private patient. And yet I had to have help from somewhere, and I finally convinced him. And he found a young psychiatrist that was doing some research work at Bellevue that agreed to see me while I was there. And I saw this young man, oh, perhaps eight or ten times, during the course of which he came to agree with me that what I needed was long-term psychiatric help, such as he could not give me, nor could he see me on any really regular basis. He was seeing me when he had a chance. And he reported this back to Dr. Kennedy, and Dr. Kennedy took enough interest in me to make an effort to find a private sanitarium that would accept me as a patient. He found that place. It was called Blythewood, it was in Greenwich, and its medical director was named Dr. Harry Tebow. And Dr. Tebow came into New York once a week to interview people who were thinking of coming to Blythewood or whose families wanted to put someone in Blythewood, and he saw me to see whether they would take me. Remember, I was broke. I had to be taken on as a charity case. Now, many good private institutions take a few people uh, for free. They don't tell anybody else so you aren't uh, pointed at or anything. You, don't, you aren't made to feel one bit different from the ones who are paying two or three hundred dollars a week. 
But I had known that this was so because I had tried to get in on that basis into Riggs Sanitarium up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, in uh, some time before Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and had not been able to do it. And Thibault interviewed me to see whether he thought that I was worth taking on on that basis. Obviously, if they were going to take someone on uh, for free, they wanted it to be someone they felt they could help and someone who was going to benefit from it and someone whom they felt was worth helping. And I was very fortunate in that he decided I was worthy and they accepted me and I moved from Bellevue up to Blythewood and it was like going from hell to heaven because Blythewood was a very beautiful place in Greenwich, it had 500 acres. This was in June that I made the move. I'd been in Bellevue since January 2nd and it was just almost too good to be true. And when I got there, I found that in the house where I was were the common rooms and also the dining room. The dining room was not too big and there were two sittings. And they assigned me to the second sitting and uh, they said that I would be sitting with three women and I was introduced to those three women and I had dinner with them. And we began to talk and uh, it turned out that one of them I had heard all about because just a few weeks before there had been a wonderful story in the newspaper, I had read it in my hospital bed in Bellevue, of this young woman from the South whose husband had brought her up to New York and put her in doctor's hospital and although her clothes had been taken away from her, she had escaped from the hospital at two o'clock in the morning uh, in her nightgown and mink coat and disappeared. And the papers were full of this disappearance. And three or four days later, uh, the story was that she had been found. Well, here she was. She was in Blythewood. And I was enthralled with this story. I thought this was a fascinating thing she'd done. And so I asked her all about it. And uh, naturally, she was an alcoholic. I don't have to tell you that, do I? What she had done when she got out of there, she hailed a cab and... Uh, her nightgown and her bedroom slippers didn't look too different from an evening dress, so the cab driver had taken her. And she was so clever. She had gone to the Martha Washington Hotel. Now that is a beautiful old lady's home, respectable to a degree, and certainly nowhere that anyone would look for an escaped drunk. <laughs> so no one had found her. And she'd managed quite nicely by having things sent up to her room until finally she decided she wanted to go out. And also she'd been drinking for several days by then. Uh, so she began calling up the department stores where she had accounts and having clothes sent down. And that's how they found her. And so her husband had picked her up and there she was in Blythewood. This was one of the three. Uh, the second one I don't remember too much about. She was not an alcoholic. She was a manic depressive, it so happened. And the third one was kind of a mystery. She claimed that she was in simply because she was convalescing from a severe illness. And uh, she had come there for the rest. Now, she lived in Old Greenwich, just a minute away. And her name was Nona Wyman. But she was not terribly amused by Martha's story. I was. Martha and I became very great friends. And Nona was kind of on the periphery. She was there, I would say, about six weeks after I came. And then she went home. And she used to invite Martha and me for lunch and a swim. And we would go over and have lunch with her and swim and uh, as I say, she was a kind of remote person. She didn't give very much, and uh, we couldn't quite make her out. We used to talk about it and wonder. It seemed an odd thing to go to a sanitarium of that type just to rest up from an illness, to be frank. We couldn't quite get it. But neither of us were suspicious. And now we will skip. I was in Blythewood in all 15 months. And it was about eight months after I had come there 
that Dr. Tebow called me in one day and said that he had come across something. He'd been given a book to read. It was a manuscript. It wasn't a book. And that he thought maybe this was what I needed. Because I may say that during that seven or eight months, I had on several occasions gotten very drunk indeed right there. Uh, it's always possible to get drinks, you know. You can't be locked up really where you can't get them. Men get them in jails and prisons. People get them in sanitariums, and I managed to get liquor. And also, we weren't locked up behind bars. We were free to go into Greenwich or Costco shopping, and occasionally... I could go into New York to the dentist or to go to a theater, and I'd go in and come back perfectly all right. Half a dozen times, eight times, the ninth time I'd come back roaring drunk. I never intended to. Tebow and I would dig and try to find out why I'd done this, and it never seemed to make very much sense. Excepting looking back later, I could see that one thing I had been doing was testing out how well was I doing? You see, Harry Tebow was the only psychiatrist in that institution who told his patients, the alcoholics, that they could never drink again. All of the other psychiatrists were teaching their patients how to drink again. Because, of course, if this was purely an underlying personality disorder, and you got treatment for that, and the disorder got straightened out, naturally you drink the way you used to. Now, this is perfect logic. The only trouble is it doesn't work. But I always figured I had the wrong doctor. <laughs> Tebow was the kind of guy who didn't like to drink much, you know, and I just thought he was a sourpuss who didn't want anybody else to drink. It used to make me very angry. And particularly, my friend Martha had a doctor who was teaching her how to drink. And uh, several other patients that I knew... Well, by that time, their doctors were teaching them how to drink, so why was I so unlucky as to get a doctor who said I couldn't drink? So naturally, I was trying it out to see how well I was doing. Was I arriving at the point where I could drink the way I used to, or wasn't I? And I never was. But it had got to a pitch where Tebow had said to me, frankly, that if it happened again, there really wasn't much point in my staying there. Because he felt he'd done all he could, and... Uh, I had done all I could, and if it wasn't working, it wasn't any point. Well, now, here I was. This was my last hope. And it was certainly something I had wanted desperately. And yet, I didn't stop drinking. I just took greater care not to get caught. And this had been going on for a couple of months, and I hadn't got caught. When, as I said, Dr. Tebow called me in and said that he had been reading this manuscript and he thought maybe this was something that would help me. And he handed it to me and the title of it was Alcoholics Anonymous. Many of you have heard me tell of what happened to me with that book. I think I will tell you again because I think it has a relation to the farm and to its meaning for me and for many of us. When I started reading the book, I was thrilled to death because here for the first time I found out what was wrong. See, even Tebow didn't use the word alcoholism. That word just wasn't used in the 1930s by anybody. So here was a description. It had a name, and I was very happy about that. I love the word alcoholism. I never had the slightest trouble accepting it or the word alcoholic. It said it was a disease. It gave a description of the disease that explained what Tebow had been unable to explain. It said that it was an allergy of the body coupled with an obsession of the mind. And that nothing could be done to change whatever this was in the body that had gone wrong or was always wrong or whatever, which made it impossible for your body to take alcohol normally. But something could be done about the obsession of the mind that drove you to drink against your own will very often when you didn't want to, and that this was a program to deal with the obsession of the mind. Well, at last, I could understand why it was 
that I couldn't go back to drinking the way I used to. Something had changed in my body, or maybe it was always there, and I would never be able to take alcohol normally. And I accepted it. The only trouble with this book was that no sooner had I found these wonderful things in it that I fell flat on my face over the word God. This I couldn't handle. I wanted no part of it. I'd outgrown that when I was 17. It was self-hypnotism. Oh, a long list of things. Anyway, I was telling Tebow all about it at every session. I would read enough of the book to have ammunition and I'd go and tear it apart to him. Also, I didn't like the way the book was written. They didn't know how to write those people, whoever they were. They sounded real weirdies to me. And it just wasn't for me. It was too bad, but it just wasn't for me. And all I got from Tebow when I'd get through with this harangue was, would you just go back and read a bit more? So I dragged my feet. And I spent over a month not even getting to the middle of the book little weensy bit at a time, hating every step of it, fighting every step of it. And then something happened in my life that affected a member of my family, and I felt that my being where I was was the cause of it. I was responsible, and there was nothing whatever that I could do about it, but nothing. And it filled me with a kind of anger I had never felt before, and I never have since, thank God, because I really saw red. I was in my room, and I had a little tiny room up on the third floor. It had been an attic room in this house once, with a little window under the eaves. And apparently the book was open on my bed as I raged, and you can imagine what I was thinking. I'm going out and get two bottles, and I'm going to get drunker than I ever got, and I'm going to tear this place apart, and I'll show them. Now, this is very typical of an alcoholic, as you all know. We are so smart that when we get angry at somebody else, we pick up the biggest sledgehammer we can find and we beat our own brains in. Real intelligent we are. And while this was going on, my eye fell on this book that was open on the bed. And I couldn't read. I didn't try. I wasn't looking to read. But there in the middle of the page, something stood out a line, as if it was in block letters, black and high and sharp. And it said simply, we cannot live with anger. And that did it. God knows why. What it was in those words that acted like a battering ram to the last of my resistance, why those words did it, I have no idea. I only know that when I realized where I was, I must have been on my knees beside the bed for quite a while because there was a big wet spot on the bedspread from the tears. I had been praying. I knew. I knew not only that there was a God, but that God was there. I had such a feeling of freedom. Well, it's almost, it, it, it isn't possible to describe it. That was the sensation, that I was free utterly and completely free. So much so that I knew I could walk out of that little window under the eaves up on the third floor and keep right on walking. I knew it. I started over toward that window and a grain of sense said, stop, go tell Tebow first. Maybe you're really nuts now. So I rushed downstairs and beat on his door. His office was in that same house. And when he opened the door and when he saw my face, he put his patient right out and took me in. And he said, what's happened? And I told him, and he questioned me closely. And he said at the end, no, he said, you're not insane. He said, I think you've had a perfectly valid spiritual experience. Many people have had them. There's a book about it. Get William James' variety of religious experience and you'll see. How many people have had things of this sort? He said, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Hang on to it. Now go on back upstairs and finish that book. So I did. And somebody would switched books. It was a brand new book up there. Never seen it before. It was the most wonderful book I'd ever read. <laughs> Wonderfully written. I loved everything in it. 
I read it through at one gulp. And when I was finished, I started and read it all over again. It was for me, that book. So I walked around on a cloud for quite a few weeks, postponing the evil day when I might have to meet some of the people who'd written the book. This I didn't want to do. I'd always been scared of people, particularly meeting new people. And I got away with this for almost a month until finally one day Dr. Tebow picked up the phone and called New York and said she will be in tonight. It was meeting night once a week in those days on Tuesday night in Bill's and Lois's house in Brooklyn. And in I went. And that was my introduction to AA. I hadn't been in that room ten minutes before I knew that this was where I belonged. That I had come home that I had found my own people. I have never changed that feeling. I get it frequently all over again when I go to a new country, for instance, or to a place where I haven't been, and go into an AA meeting or an AA club, and there's nobody there that I've known before, and in five minutes, you know how it is. You feel as if you'd known them forever. And I had that feeling immediately. Dr. Tebow wanted me to remain on at Blythewood, although I felt perfectly ready then to pick up and go my way. I was kind of a guinea pig. I think he wanted to see what, it ha what would happen. And so I stayed almost six months. And finally, in mid-September, I was due to go. This was 1939. I had attended my first meeting on April 13th. Two days before I left, the ambulance had screamed up and a stretcher had been carried out and there was a girl in a straitjacket on the stretcher and it was Nona Wyman. And she had been brought back. Nona, of course, was an alcoholic. But she wasn't giving in those earlier talks between Martha and me about our drinking exploits. She just never told anybody anything. I didn't get to see her because she was not seeable those two days. And she was a patient of another doctor. She was a patient of one of the doctors that taught his patients how to drink. So I came back to Blythewood nearly every weekend for many months. And I attempted to see Nona for two or three weeks running. And her psychiatrist did not want me to talk to her about AA. He didn't believe in it. He didn't know what it was that had happened to me, but apparently he didn't like it. Or he didn't think it would last or something. And I was very distressed about this. But I wasn't getting anywhere. There wasn't much I could do. And one day in New York, I had a telegram from her psychiatrist saying that she had run away that she was apparently holed up in, I forget whether it was not the Lexington Hotel, but the hotel on Lexington Avenue. And would I do what I could? Would I go and see her? So I went over. Well, she was really in a bad way. She was terribly drunk. She was suicidal. It wasn't possible really to talk to her. We had a member in those early days, it was a doctor. And I called him because she was really beyond my handling. And he came over and gave her a shot to quiet her and said he would try to get a nurse for the night if I would relieve the nurse at eight in the morning. He thought he could get one for the night. He didn't think he could get one or get them around the clock. He did get a nurse for the night. I did relieve her at eight in the morning. And Nona woke up more or less in her right mind, and I started talking AA. Of course, I had the book with me. And I started reading it out loud to her. She was receptive. She was willing to listen. And as we talked and I read, and this went on all morning long, she started telling me about a farm. She said that one reason she hadn't felt that she could talk about this, or even that there was much needed to be done about it, was that she had found a part answer. 
that she and her husband both drank too much, but they had a friend who had suggested some three or four years before that that they go up to a place in Connecticut where this friend thought they might find some help. And they had started going up to this farm near Kent, which was run by a very strange little old lady, she said, who called herself Sister Frances, who was a deeply spiritual person, and the farm was run on spiritual lines. She said, you know, I believe that this AA that you're telling me about is exactly what she's trying to do. I think she'd be very excited about this. Because Walter and I are not the only people like us that have gone to that farm. And she said, the interesting thing was that I never wanted a drink while I was up there. I never drank while I was at the farm. But I wouldn't be home very long before I'd start again. And Walter, who came up for weekends, she'd stay the whole summer never drank while he was up there either, no matter what condition he arrived in or for his vacation that he spent up there. She said, it does something strange to you. I don't know what it is. It's wonderful. But of course, we can't live there all the time, so there, must, there has to be something that'll work when we're not there. But it has something, that place. And I know that Sister Frances would believe in what you're telling me because this is the kind of thing that, that she's trying to do. You've got to come and see it. Well, to collapse things a little bit, Nona and Walter had already separated and uh, their affairs were in the hands of a lawyer. They started proceedings for divorce. And she decided after four or five days that she would see Walter personally instead of just through the lawyer. And she did, and she was sober, and he was so startled he wanted to know how she'd done it. And she told him about AA, and he joined too. A few weeks later, the two of them succeeded in getting some of us to agree to go up and see this remarkable place. It was a beautiful weekend in October, toward the end of October, and we drove up. There was Bill and Lois and Horace Crystal and Bert Taylor and myself with the Wymans. Uh, all of you know what it's like as you come over the hill and, or come up to the top of the hill and suddenly there's that adorable little house with just a smallish barn across from it in those days. And we were all much struck by it and I think you also know how beautiful it is in October. It was a lovely day. But as we got out of the car and walked up to the house, Bill was right behind me and we stepped over the threshold and Bill turned to me and he said, my God, he said, you could cut it with a knife. And I said, yes, you could. The atmosphere, the feeling. There was something there, something that was really palpable that you could feel. And every one of us felt it. To say that we fell in love with it is not to use the right terminology at all. We were engulfed in it. That was one of the most wonderful weekends I have ever spent. We walked through the woods. We saw all the little cabins. We had a roaring fire in the fireplace. We talked far into the night with this extraordinary woman called Sister Frances, who was a very lovely person with a wonderful sense of humor, incidentally. Because when we asked her why she called us, well, she called us all sister and brother, every one of us. She said she did this because she had such a bad memory for names. And this solved the problem. She called everybody sister or brother. And the reason she called herself Sister Francis was because St. Francis of Assisi was her favorite saint. And she also had a great feeling for animals. That's why she was a vegetarian and would never wear any animal skin. She only wore canvas shoes. She didn't wear anything that had come from an animal, nor did she ever eat any meat or flesh. And she had adopted St. Francis' name. Her real name was Ethelred Folsom. I'm not surprised she took Francis. <laughs> Before that weekend was over, 
And I think I'm making it clear, as I intended to do, that West and others have given me far too much credit. I was merely an instrument. I was a bridge. And I was a bridge because I tried to help an alcoholic named Nona. The farm was a direct result of something we all do that we call 12th step work, for which no individual deserves any credit, in my opinion. And what is at the farm was already at the farm before we ever found it. It found us, in my opinion. The story of that farm, as I had it from Sister Frances, is pretty fascinating. She had gone on a spiritual search, oh, 30, 40 years before, not finding what she wanted in her own Orthodox church. And she had become interested in the study of metaphysics, and she had gone and studied with a woman named Emma Curtis Hopkins, who had been a teacher of metaphysics at the same time as Mary Baker Eddy, but lived longer than Mary Baker Eddy, and who had gone in a different direction from Christian science, although there were many basic things that were similar. And Sister Frances had lived in Boston for several years studying with Emma Curtis Hopkins and had adopted this philosophy as her belief and her way of life. And she had felt that she wanted to do something concrete about it, that this was something the world needed, that people needed. And she had some money. And she set out looking for a place. And apparently she searched for a long while until one day she found this, it's really a cup in the hills. And there were three farms in this cup, and she bought all three of them. And her original idea was that one of them would be for older people who could retire there and devote themselves to spiritual study. One would be for children who were to be brought up in this way of thinking without fear and in love. And I'm quoting from Sister Frances. And the middle one... This was to be the come and go one. This was the place for people who were in trouble of any kind, whether it was physical trouble or mental trouble or spiritual trouble, material trouble, that they could come up there and stay as long as they liked. The idea being that they could try to find themselves, and if they did, they would go away refreshed and able once again to cope with life. Well, Sister Frances was a true idealist. She lived up to her ideals. There was no money involved in this. There was a basket that hung on the door. And people who came were expected to put in the basket whatever they wanted to. So it wasn't too long before she lost two of the three farms. Not enough money was in the baskets. And she herself had put most of what she had into the original purchase. But the middle farm, the one that was the in-and-out farm, is the one that remained, and it is the one that today we call High Watch. She called it Joy Farm. She had incorporated, uh, for tax purposes and other reasons, because one of the things that she did there was to print and distribute the writings of Emma Curtis Hopkins. And in the wing of the house, down in the lower part, there was a printing press, and enormous stocks of literature when I first went up there. And they were mailed out from there, the pamphlets, all over the world. And people came there from all over the world. There was an English woman living there. At that time, there was a Russian woman. Uh, there were several Indians that uh, were there on and off during the first couple of years. Uh, the farm was known all over the world, and people came there. But the thing that really happened to Sister Frances when she met A.A. was that she fell in love with A.A. This, she felt, was putting into practice what she believed in. And she felt that those of us whom she met were living the way she believed. And we, God knows, appreciated what was there. We all made use of the little chapel. We all went in there for our quiet time. And before the end of the weekend, she'd offered it to us, lock, stock, and barrel. She said, take it. 
She said, we're incorporated as a nonprofit corporation, the Ministry of the High Watch. That's where that name came from. There are two or three board members whom I know would agree with me entirely that you people can use this place the way it ought to be used. Take it. And Bill said, no, we can't take it. AA doesn't own any property and doesn't want to. We can use it, but we won't take it. And that's how it was. Now, Walter Wyman had already gone on the board at her request, even before he joined AA and sobered up. Because after all, remember, she saw him sober when he was up there, and he was a very nice man, very fine man. And she then asked if some one of us would go on the board, and I was tapped for it, so I went on the board. And we began making use of the farm. And when I say making use of it, what I mean is that we would take somebody up there for a week or two weeks, usually stay with them. Many of us in those early days of 39, 40, 41, 42 didn't have jobs. We were free to do this kind of thing. There wasn't any money involved unless we wanted to put it down, and we began making payments when we stayed up there as much as we could. Sister Frances lived there all the time at that point, and so did this English woman, and so did the Russian woman in the first year. I went up there so frequently I was working like a beaver to get some women into AA and not having very much luck. I was always taking someone up there. So I saw a great deal of it, and the following summer, I spent my, by that time had a job, I spent my vacation up there, and there was a little cabin that became, in effect, mine, the one I always used and stayed in. Unfortunately, it burned down one winter. Somebody got the stove too hot and went out for a walk, and it burned down. But it was, it was a real home for me. It was for most of us, and we loved it. And for several years, we didn't think about doing anything more than simply taking people up there. It was the atmosphere that we took them for. First place, it got them away from the drinking situation and their own situation, whatever it was. And in the second place, there isn't any question that there was something healing just about being there. And it was during that time, several years after that, I think, that my mother came east and we were supporting my mother, and I didn't have very much money, and neither did my sisters or brother. And mother went up and lived at the farm, and she ran the farm for about a year. And then I was up there a great deal and saw a lot of it. And incidentally, it was open the year round in those days. Before my mother came east, there was one other very personal connection I had with it. I've never hidden the fact that I had three slips after I came into AA. And uh, the first and the third were both over the holidays, Christmas and New Year's. The other one was in the middle, in the summer. Three within one year. It was in my first year and a half. And the third slip that I had, I started to drink. I called for help. It was the day before New Year's. And a friend drove me up to the farm. And the snow was about six feet deep. You couldn't come in from the Kent side. We came in the back road and got stuck in the snow and had to walk the last mile and a half. And I was like this. So I know what the farm means to someone who needs it. Because I needed it. And I found there what I needed. So I've had that experience with it too. These are some of the reasons why I feel so close to it and why I am so deeply moved by this event here. Gradually, Sister Frances was getting older and didn't feel that she wanted to be there all the time and felt that someone from AA that knew how to, how to deal with these people ought to be there. And we began trying to find somebody who would manage it. And it was during this period that I was vice president of the board. Sister Frances was president, but she wouldn't act, so I had to act as president. Ed 
Hare tells me that he has been looking through some of those early records and it's Marty Mann did this and Marty Mann did that. Well, she had to. <laughs> there wasn't much choice. And we hadn't been able to get too much interest in, uh, in doing any work about it. But little by little, people became more interested in it, particularly as people came away from there and stayed sober. Dating way back from the period of my mother, sitting right down there in front of me is Mary Hemp. There are a number of people here, I think, that went to the farm quite early, that were early graduates of it, before it was even uh, thought to do it on the basis it's being done now. But gradually, little by little, it was transformed into truly an AA place. Now, you know that AA as such doesn't own it, but in effect, today, AA runs it. And there's something I very much want to say. As a board member, I served during a number of years when we were having difficulty finding the right person to run the farm. And long after I went off the board, the difficulties persisted. It was not easy to find the right person. And sometimes we had someone who was the right person but didn't want to go on doing it. And it was, uh, it was somewhat of a problem. But from all that I hear, and from all that I've seen when I've been up there, that problem has been ended ever since the Irvines moved to the farm. <laughs> so this makes me particularly happy. That after 25 years, here is a going concern, doing a tremendous amount of good, being used to its fullest potential. And I think anyone who has been there knows what I'm talking about when I talk about the atmosphere. And I know one thing. I know that Kay and Wes know exactly what I'm talking about. And that they have been able to use that to see that people kept coming up there had the chance to feel it and appreciate it. It's a very great gift that was given to us, I think. I know of no one who was happier at the way that gift was being used than Sister Frances herself. And her only unhappiness was a short period when she was in a place that was too far away for her to get to the farm as often as she wanted to in her last few years. Many of us who have known it and loved it will always feel that it's ours, too. And I suspect that anyone that's been up there gets that feeling. You can't help feeling a little proprietary about it. It, it enters your heart in such a way that it does become a part of you. It is a great healing force. It is a very wonderful thing that has been made available to us. I have visited a great many places that have indeed sprung up in its image and others that sprang up not knowing anything about it. And many of them are very good and many of them are doing a good job and helping a lot of people. But I have never been anywhere in the world that has the thing I'm talking about that exists at the farm. And I, it's a feeble word, atmosphere. I don't quite know how to describe it. There is something in the air. There, God has his finger on it. Thank God. Thank you very much, Marty. It certainly was interesting to me and I'm sure to many of, of you sitting out there to hear how High Watch started and, as Marty says, how it's doing now. And I'm sure that many of the graduates, so to speak, feel the same way. Now, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, when we come to the close of the regular meeting. And I know that uh, some of the younger 
people and members are looking forward to a few uh, rounds around the room with their favorite uh, girl. And uh, I imagine all the tables have to be taken away, so there will be a uh, short uh, intermission before the music starts. And uh, in closing, I'd just like to say that it's been a privilege for me to do the best I could up here tonight. And uh, it certainly is a privilege for me to be part of, of the High Watch uh, farm. And I do hope that uh, what I found in AA, if I can just uh, perhaps help somebody up there, and if nothing more than by the example that each and every one of us uh, set to one another when we stay away from that one drink one day at a time. And so in a few minutes, I believe there will be uh, dancing and uh, we can all walk around and meet old friends and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. And I believe, uh, I, I must say that I forgot to ask, but do we close in the usual manner, if we'd all care to join in the usual manner. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.